any Canadian about salmon and they will tell you something about salmon. We are well versed in our salmon. But where exactly they live and that they live in our backyards, I think that's still a little bit of a hidden secret. That idea of salmon, we talk about the Adams River, we talk about the Skeena, we talk about Haida Gwaii, these wild places. Well, we have wild places in our little urban centers too of Burnaby and North Vancouver and West Vancouver. It's interesting, if you're near Westminster, the very first little creek coming in is the Brunette River. It's right just north, of, directly north of New Westminster. So it's sort of the first tributary of probably thousands of tributaries feeding into the Fraser River. So it's a nice little example of a really nice creek. Certainly there were three First Nations villages at the mouth of the Brunette because it was such a great salmon resource. And the very first the land settler in Burnaby was William Holmes, and when they, when they allowed non-native people to take up land in 1860 in the colony of British Columbia, which is the mainland, William Holmes got lot number one, and um, it was right on the Brunette River where North Road crossed the Brunette River, and he, he mentions the First Nations people being on, on his property, quotation marks, uh, drying salmon and so forth uh, from the river. And now you can see that the whole mouth is completely occupied by a great big sawmill. And this sawmill next door became the biggest sawmill in the British Empire. And so they took out, in 1901, for example, 27 million salmon from the Fraser River in 1901. That maybe was the peak year. Now we're down to almost nothing. The Burnett River is an important salmon stream in the lower Fraser Valley for a number of reasons. It's as fish habitat in its own right. It uh, supports healthy populations of coho salmon, chum salmon, steelhead, cutthroat trout, and it extends, you know, from its from its mouth in New Westminster through parts of Burnaby all the way into East Vancouver. So another important thing about it is it's visible. And it it uh, also supports salmon that are uh, moving downstream from all over the Fraser watershed. You know, salmon as juveniles migrate out to the, to the estuary and then to the ocean. And they do that in a series of, of hops. So they will travel downstream and then tuck into the to lower reaches of, of rivers and streams to feed and to rest. And the lower brunette is, is particularly important because these types of areas are very rare in the lower river. Many of them are cut off by dikes and floodgates and just simply not accessible to salmon anymore. So in the spring, we regularly catch Chinook, for example, that are coming down from the interior or further up in the Fraser Valley, and will come a couple of kilometers into the lower Grant River to, uh, to feed before migrating out to the estuary. Might Something that uh, most people might not think of. So there's a variety of ways in which it's important. Our group actually sort of came out of a tragic event back in 1998. Something that unfortunately some people are not aware of are that all of the street drains, if you think of those grids on the edges of streets and in parking lots, all of those drains connect directly to creeks around the lower mainland. There's no filtration, there's no nothing. That's where most of the water actually comes from nowadays because so much of our urban area is paved and built on. So somebody who didn't know that those drains connect to the creek, poured some kind of a toxin down a drain. I don't think they were malicious, they just didn't know better. And it wiped out everything. Uh, volunteers counted over 3,000 dead fish. There were even uh, some dead mammals like beavers, uh, a dead eagle, probably because it might have eaten some of the poisoned fish. So when that tragedy happened, it really galvanized the community. People came together and they said, oh my God, you know, like, how could something this terrible happen right in our backyard? So we began poking around, and then one fall, we were walking down this trail that goes beside the creek here, and we heard this tremendous splashing noise. And I'm a prairie boy. I grew up in Saskatoon. I didn't know much about salmon then. My wife is from Japan, and we thought, well, let's check out this strange sound. And we followed the sound, and we ran across a beautiful salmon. It was probably, oh, a good 60, 70 meters long, and it was just down the creek here, maybe 100 meters. 
And we were just astounded. Uh, it was just an amazing sight to see. We couldn't believe it. Here we are right in the middle of a city, beautiful fish coming back. So we were hooked immediately. Uh, and we had, we had to learn more about it. It used to be that we'd be out here on the creek doing some activities and people would stop and say, what, what are you doing? Well, you know, what are, and we say, well, we're, we're monitoring salmon or we're, we're trapping little salmon to identify them and then releasing them or something. There's, there's fish in this creek? <laughs> that people would be totally surprised. But that's really changed. I've noticed, especially in the last few years now, that people will come along and, you know, we've been volunteering on this creek for so many years that people start to recognize and say, are the fish back? <laughs> you know, they know now. And so that's really cool. I, I find that just so exciting because that's what hooks people, is when they actually see a salmon in the creek and their eyes just get big and they, some people literally start gasping in amazement. And it's just wonderful to see in the city. Well, for me, I grew up in the countryside in a small village, Garva, in County Londonderry in Northern Ireland. And as a child, I fished on the Givy River. You can see the shirt I'm wearing it's from the Givy Anglers Association. That was a community group that was involved in caretaking and stewardship on the local river. And when I came to Canada, when I got to the position in my life where I was able to give back, I got involved in the Stony Creek uh, Environment Committee and I started volunteering and I found that it was really a passion to see the return of fish in a watershed where they hadn't been for 50 years. Now in the early days the Stony Creek Committee was started by a lady and our centre here is, lit, is named after a lady called Jennifer Atchison. Jennifer Atchison was a retired school teacher and she probably spent 50 to 60 hours a week on the concerns of Stony Creek. She was actually the lady who in the early 90s got the Stony Creek Environment Committee together. When Jennifer and the Sabrin Fishing Game Club gentlemen like Elmer Rudolph had the vision to try and bring salmon back to the Stony Creek and the Burnett River watershed People laughed at them. They told them they were crazy, they were stupid. They told them <clears throat> it can't be done. But you know, we've shown that it can be done. I liked a lot of, do a lot of fishing and I used to fish a lot in the Fraser River. And uh, one day I got thinking, you know, um, I keep taking fish out of the river, keep taking fish, but maybe it's time I started doing something to put something back. And uh, at the time, one of, my, uh, one of my friends said, oh, he said, you should go and, and join the Sapper Fish and Game Club. He said, they're a real keen organization and they're doing a lot of good work. And uh, joined up and that was in 1984 and this is 2020 and I'm still here. When we did bring the salmon back, the story went all the way across Canada, all the way across North America. And we were getting phone calls from, from places back in, in the eastern seaboard of the United States saying, how did you do that? How did you do that? We've been trying to do that. How did you do that? So we said, well, you know what? There is no manual. We made it up as we went along. And uh, the difference today is, if you want to do something like that today, in the last 10 years or so and, and in 2020, there are manuals for you. There are, there are people that teach stream keepers how to restore streams and things like that. In the, in the days when we started, there was nothing. We wrote the book. In the 1960s and 70s, they didn't understand how important salmon were to our ecology and our environment. They now understand. Now it's a matter of faith that people understand, yes, it's very important. We have these salmon bring, coming back, not only to our streams that are isolated and remote way up in the mountains somewhere, but we have these salmon coming back to our streams right in the middle of our cities. And what it means is that if we can have salmon healthy, coming back into healthy streams in the middle of our cities, it means we're doing something right. It means we're not polluting, that it means 
We're living uh, a better lifestyle because we're now supporting um, fragile ecosystems that couldn't, couldn't exist uh, unless we were taking very great care with how we were living. We have to look after nature. We have to look after the world's environment, not just the environment in our local stream, in our local municipality, but we have to get together and we have to share around the world and come to our realization that everyone around the world, we have to look after the world's environment because if we don't look after the world's environment, we're done for.